The codependent's love is another mixture of the narcissist's shared fantasy and the borderline's emotional dysregulation. Here's another autobiographical story about my maternal grandfather and my maternal grandmother. The story of a codependent's love. My grandfather, cradling an infant scrib, departed. Navigating left and right, far along the pavement, he reached a concrete round post. There he rested, sheltered from the humid sun by peeling posters for lacrimose Turkish films. He pushed the crib outside the penumbral circle and waited. Curious folks besieged the old man and his orphaned frame, and then proceeded to buy from him the salted seeds and sweets that he lay meticulously organized inside the crib. My grandfather smiled at them through sea blue eyes as he wrapped the purchased sweetmeats in rustling brown paper bags. My embarrassed uncles built for him a creaking wooden cart from remaindered construction materials. They painted it green and mounted it on a large, thin tired whiz borrowed from an ancient tram. They attached to it a partition tabletop confiscated from the greengrocer down the lane. Every morning, forehead wrinkled, my grandfather would fill the wooden compartments with various snacks and trinkets at pains to separate them neatly. There were black sun, sunflower seeds, white pumpkin seeds, the salted and the sweet, tiny plastic toys bursting with candies, whistles, rattles. And still, my grandfather never gave up his crib, installing the crib on top of his squeaking vehicle and filling it to its tattered brim with a rainbow of offerings. At night, my grandfather stowed it under the cart, locking it behind its two crumbling doors, among the unsold merchandise. With sunrise, my grandfather would exit the house and head towards the miniature plot of garden adjoining it. He would cross the patch, stepping carefully on, pebbled, on a pebbled path in its midst. Then, sighing, but never stooping, my grandfather would drive his green trolley, a tall and stout and handsome man, fair-skinned and sapphire-eyed. A movie star, they gasped behind his back. Day in and day out, my grandfather impelled his rickety pushcart to its concrete post, there dispensing to the children with a smile all kinds of sweets, a permanence till dusk. With sunset, he gathered his few goods, bolted the fledgling uh, flaps, and pushed back home a few steps away. When my grandfather grew old, he added to his burden a stool with an attached umbrella to shield him from the elements and a greenish nylon sheet to protect his wares. My grandfather became a fixture in this town of my birth. His lime cart turned into a meeting spot. By Pardo, we will meet by Pardo, they would say, secure in the knowledge that he would always be there, erect and gracious. Like two forces of nature, my grandpa and the concrete post, older than the fading movie posters, Watch the town transform, roads asphalted, children turn adults, bringing their offspring to buy from him a stick of bitter black chewing gum as they had done. Lone by his cart, my grandfather bid the dead farewell and greeted the newborn, himself aging and bending with the years. 
Croesus sprouted in his face, around his dimming sides, and in his white and delicate hands. My, my grandfather had one love, my grandmother, a ravishing, proud, raven-haired woman. A framed, retouched photo of her hung imposing on one of the walls. In it, she stood defiant, leaning on a carved pillar in a faraway place. This is how he must have seen her at first, a mysterious, sad-eyed disparity between dark and fair. And thus he fell in love and made her his only world. This woman sat by his side, adjacent to his azure pushcart, day in and day out. She said nothing, and he remained mute. They just stared with vacuous eyes, perhaps away, perhaps inside, perhaps back to previous abodes in bustling cities. At first, my grandmother seemed to like being his sidekick, confidently doling confectionery to toddlers whose mothers remained forever infants in her memory. Intermittently, she laid a shriveled hand on his venous, venous knee, leaving it there for a split, fluttering second, conveying warmth and then withdrawing it unobtrusively. It was enough to restore him to his full stature, this touch. But then the municipal workers came and pasted funeral announcements onto his concrete pole, and the magic was all but gone. My grandma withered, dilapidated by this onerous existence. Evening time she would get up and carry her stool a four, clenched in two twiggy hands tediously dragging her reluctant self on the long march home. My grandfather observed her, his eyes a moist, eroding guilt. His disintegrating pushcart, the rain-drenched figure of his loved one, the whizzing torment of the desert winds, the sound of the cackling, crackling paper bags in her arthritic palms, they all conspired to deny him his erstwhile memory of her. Each morning, my grandfather woke up to study this ageless image as he glided over her translucent skin, high arching cheeks, and sleep fluttery eyelashes. He fended off the intrusions of the world as he smoothed the covers and tucked her figure in. Then he would get up and make her breakfast arranging ceremoniously her medicines in multicolored plastic containers on the tray. But my grandma rejected this uh, sun-up plea. She wouldn't go on living. One silent morning she clung to her sheets and wouldn't rise and accompany him. That day, grey and defeated, my grandpa plowed the pavement with his burrow, unfolded a worn deck chair, and sank in, awaiting my grandmother's re reappearance. When she did not materialize, he left his post much earlier than usual. He emptied the compartments duteously, packed the unsold goods in large canvas sacks, tidying them away behind the two bottom doors of his cart. He then unfurled the polyester sheet above it and sailed home, shoving and cajoling his screeching and scraping workstation. My grandma was in bed as he had left her, ensconced in blankets, a suicidal tortoise glaring at the ceiling as it bled in aqueous abstracts. My grandfather parked his rustling, rusting, faded wagon and climbed home. His wife awoke with startled whimpers, tears streaming silently down her creviced face, tearing his heart with the iron grip of festering love. He hugged her and showered her with panicky little kisses. 
she froze and fortified her birth with pillows piled high, staring at him through narrow cracks of oozing sanity. One day my grandpa, returning in the evening, left his cart outside uncharacteristically. He entered and for a few minutes he and my grandmother just watched each other warily. He extended a calloused hand and she dreamily stood up and escorted him to their porch, which overlooked the weed-grown garden. My grandfather draped her shoulders with a knitted woolen shawl. He tightened it and then, her shivering hand in his, he set his love among some cushions he prepared. She glanced aimlessly at a guava tree that shot among a trail of gravel stones. My grandfather contemplated her a while and then, with sudden resoluteness, left. Seconds later, he reappeared among the shrubs, saluted her with a sledgehammer he held tenuously with both hands. She strained her face, attentive, consuming his image like a flower would the sun, or the blind do the sounds. Gasping and panting, my grandpa heaved the pushcart to the center of the plot. With repeated furious blows, he dislocated its wheels and doors. Reduced to splintered wood and twisted metal, he cocooned it in the nylon throw and left it devastated by the trees. Sitting beside, they watched the setting sun diffracted from the green-hued sculpture in the garden. A smile budded in my grandma's honeyed eyes and spread into my grandfather's deep blue gaze. The cart stood there for years, disintegrating inexorably beneath its blackening shield. Its wheels, now rooted in the soil, it sank into the mildewed ground, another peculiarly shaped sapling. My grandpa never adjusted the synthetic sheet that swathed it, nor did he dig out the bargaining wheels. My grandpa was visiting a pharmacy, replenishing my grandmother's medications when my grandma died. With the dignity of the indigent, he never bargained, never raised his voice. Packed in small white paper bags, he rushed the doses to his wife, limping and winded. This time, the house was shuttered doors and windows. My grandma wouldn't respond to his increasingly desperate entreaties. He flung himself against the entrance and found her sprawled on the floor, her bloodied mouth ajar. As she fell, she must have hit her head against the corner of a table. She was baking my grandfather his favorite pastries. My grandmother's eyes were shut. My grandpa knew she had died. He placed her remedies on the floor, flowered and oil table, and changed into his best attire, his best suit. Kneeling beside her, he gently wiped clean my grandma's hands and mouth and head, and clothed her in her outdoors coat. His business done, he lay beside her, and hugging her frail remains, he shut his eyes. My uncles and aunts found them, lying like that, embraced. My grandparents' tiny home was government property and was reclaimed. The sanitary engineers revolted, removed from the garden, the warm infested rotting relic and the putrid sheet concealing it. The next day it was hauled by sturdy garbage collectors into a truck and with assorted other junk incinerated.